Welcome, Rexdale Alliance Church family. And visitors, anyone who's watching, we are so happy that you are joining us for worship this morning. One of the themes that we've been exploring uh, and what we will talk about today is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how we are the temple and how God makes us that temple and fills us up to then spread to the rest of the world. We hope you will enjoy the time that you spend in your community, wherever you are watching this, whatever time you're watching this, and know that you are loved. Oh 
But I know your love does not run dry. Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? During this time of isolation, um, it's really easy to become disconnected from the truth. And so I want us to really hone in on this. We can turn inward and turn away from the truth but it is important that we come back and remember that we are a temple of God. You are not forsaken. Your body belongs to God. Your heart belongs to Jesus. You are a temple. So take these words of scripture to heart and worship. Thank you, worship team. And before we spend some time in corporate prayer, just a couple of announcements about a few things going on. First, starting June 14th, Monday, June 14th, on our website and on the app, you will be able to find the recommendation form for the nominating committee for elders at our church. They get voted in at the annual general meeting in November, but this is the official beginning of that process. So if you have somebody you would like to nominate, all the forms and everything for that are online. Please check it out. 
Other thing, day camp is coming. So that means a few things. Number one, please be in prayer for it. Uh, number two, they are doing some fundraisers to help with scholarships for campers, as well as for honorariums for staff, etc. And so one of those fundraisers is going on right now, and that is where they are requesting if you have unneeded or broken jewelry, specifically gold and silver, they will take that because they can then trade that in and get cash that they will use for all the different camp expenses. Or if you just want to donate towards day camp, there's a lot of expenses. Our hope and our prayer is to run it in person this year, which would mean mostly outside, which means tents and spacing and those kinds of things. So we have some costs for that, but we are looking forward to that outreach. On that note, something I am excited to say is every year we apply for government grants that we use towards day camp. This year we applied for several and the government had opened it up to wider things and we were um, funded 16 different grants. A lot of those are going to day camp, but we have a few other positions that will be opening up at the church. And so it's for young people up to age, I believe 29. So keep an eye on that. There'll be some jobs posted, might be something that uh, is of value to you, but we are thankful for these grants and the government support as we try to reach children with our day camp and that fundraiser. There'll be other ones coming, so keep an eye on those. But day camp is coming. On that note, as we talk about day camp and about having a good time with children, I think it's appropriate that we stop and we recognize the tragedy that was discovered uh, this past week with the 215 children in a mass grave in a residential school in BC. And so the CNMA has put out an official statement regarding this. If you want to know how our denomination is responding and thinking, please check out the website. But we think it would be appropriate, as are several faith communities across the country, to stop and to take a moment of silence in honor of these children who are very precious in God's eyes, their families, and the entire situation and the truth and reconciliation that needs to happen. So before Cheryl comes and prays more specifically to things to our church, let's take a moment of silence and prayer for this situation in Kamloops. Father, you are the God of all comfort. So we ask that you would comfort the family, the friends, the communities, the relatives of these 215 precious souls that were lost. You care about children, they're precious in your sight. We're so sorry that they were not viewed precious here. Would you comfort? Would you bring mercy and grace and healing and truth and reconciliation. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, dear friends. Good to be with you on the other side of the screen. Thank you, worship team, for focusing our eyes and hearts on the Lord, and TJ for the announcements, and remembering the lost and abused children of the residential schools. Our hearts are truly broken. Dear friends, I know we miss one another, it can seem silent the other six days. Where's the church? What are you doing? I can ensure you that ministry continues. Staff comes to the office. We are meeting others online, on the phone, through prayer, study, and even meeting in the building when appropriate, such as the food bank. On Thursday mornings, the women have been engaging in different spiritual practices to make space for God to have more of Him. That's why we do spiritual practices to make space for God in our lives, and to have more of Him, which means to be shaped by Him, to know Him more, to be transformed and be in relationship with Him. There's many spiritual practices, ones that are common, such as prayer, Bible study, worship. Then there's others, such as gratitude, simplicity, relinquishment, examine, and more. We've been using an app called Lectio 365 by Pete Gregg, and it can aid us in our spiritual practices. Lectio is a Latin word which means reading. 
The Lectio 365 is the reading of scripture and prayer mixed together, along with listening to God, contemplation, confession, and worship. This resource has a morning and evening reading. You can download it on your mobile device by searching Lectio 365 or finding it on the 247prayer.com. As we go to prayer, I'll be using some of the May 14th readings and prayer, which focuses on Matthew 28 and speaks of the disciples who worshiped Jesus before he ascended, but also it says that some doubted. The Greek verb distazo, used for doubt, means to hesitate and to have uncertainty. Jesus was risen, but he was leaving them. I think in the continued season of COVID, there's many emotions for us. Our congregation has experienced joys of baby births, soul rest, greater togetherness for some families, and simple pleasures. But our congregation has experienced sorrows, family deaths with no gathering, long extended times apart, loneliness, fears, and more. And now in Canada, we have the joy of less COVID as vaccines increase, but deep sadness and mourning over the horrific child abuse with the finding of the 215 Indigenous children at the residential school. Let's take our hesitancy and uncertainty to God in prayer the one who holds us close to his heart. As we enter prayer together, let's pause to be still. Let's say, come, Lord Jesus. Creator God, as we approach your throne of grace, you who formed humanity from dust, breathe in us again. Revive us and sanctify us by the power of your Spirit. We bring you our praise, for you are the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. You never grow weak or tired. No one can measure the depths of your understanding. Yet in our humanity, we have such uncertainty. We are like the disciples and hesitant, since we have witnessed death without comfort, confusion without answers, and evil without rescue. God, meet us in our uncertainty. Help us in our questions to bring our broken praise and hope, even in the waiting. Speak tender tenderly your comfort to the First Nation people. Gently lead them, love them, and carry them in your arms. Bring peace and justice by your power powerful arm, and let nothing oppose your will from being done. In times of uncertainty, we remember that the promise of your presence is certain and true. You are with us to the end of the age. You rule with a powerful arm and have no equal. You give power to the weak and strength to the powerless, and your word will stand forever. So it is on you, Lord, that we rest our hope. It is in you we find our strength. O oh, Jesus, let COVID pass away. Let joy come in the morning. And Father, let the church be true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, serving them and being kind to all we meet. Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. O come, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Many things have an intended purpose for which they were designed. The problem comes when you use that for something other than how it was designed. Let me give you a few examples. Social media was actually created to connect us, not to divide us, to perpetuate hate, or to spread fake news. Dynamite was actually meant for construction purposes, not as a weapon of mass destruction. The silencer, there's reason to believe it was meant for hunting so the animal wouldn't hear you, not as a murder weapon. Or, here's one, a, uh, a chef's knife. In the right hands, used the right way, can make you a great meal. In the wrong hands, used the wrong way, yeah, you get the idea. I bring that up because our topic for today, in this series we've been doing of Who Am I? Our answer today, today's topic message topic, is I am the temple 
of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the body today, which is something we don't normally do in our services, but here it is. The idea is, what is our body? If we're the temple, is this thing more than just a mass of molecules? Does it have intention or design by the one who created it? I'm going to argue, yes, it does. God made us. He created us. We've talked about that. He now lives inside of us. If we found our identity in him, we are his temple. We are intended to glorify him and to live as an act of worship. Now we're nearing the end of this series. There's only one or two more messages. So how do we get here? Well, actually we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Let me give you a couple of stories. One, if I understand correctly, ancient Egyptian temples would be built to a God and the temple was built in such a way that the architecture and the design would show you the creation story according to that God. And then they'd build the temple. And then in the very center of the temple, they would place the idol, the image of that God. Let me tell you another story according to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we see the creation story. And in the middle of his creation, in this temple that he is designing, he has a garden. And in the middle of the garden, he places humans made in the image of God. Which brings us back to the very first two messages in this series. Number one, I am created. Number two, I am made in the image of God and am therefore valuable. After that, if you follow our series, I'm pursued by a, for a relationship with God by God himself. I am justified. I am adopted into God's family and enjoy a relationship with God. I am loved and never alone, even if I feel lonely and I am free. Free from what? Well, free from sin and its power, free from fear, free from guilt, free from shame, and free, two things, free to live a new life. Which brings us to our last message in this series in this one. What are we free to do? What does that new life look like? Well, one of them is that I am an ambassador for King Jesus. In other words, I have a boss and I have a job to do. Represent him well, speak well for him. My boss is King Jesus. And then the second one is today. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. That matters. Why? Well, to answer that, I want to remind you of that old computer commercial where you would see the sticker, the logo of Intel Inside. That was supposed to imply that there's something different going on on the inside that is going to affect the operation and the outside. I bring that up to say that at salvation, when you're justified, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And part of your identity in Christ is it's almost like you have a sticker that says Holy Spirit inside, implying that there's something different going on on the inside that is going to affect what's going on on the outside. Because the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're like me, which just means you grew up maybe in uh, Western North American church, uh, the idea, the concept of temple is kind of a bit of a foreign concept. I remember one of the more confusing things as an eight or a nine-year-old is I would go to church on Sunday and then I would go to the same church on Wednesday and all the pews would stay, but we would move all the chairs out of the back of the auditorium because it made a big open space. And at Awana on Wednesday night, we could run relay races and play games and do all sorts of fun things in that area. And then we would go back to church on Sunday. And if me or my friends ran in that same area on Sunday, we would get in trouble because now we're running in the house of God. It was kind of confusing. And then you would hear sermons about Solomon's temple in Jerusalem in the Old Testament, and how special it was. The cedar was imported from Lebanon. Everything was overlaid with gold. And I would look around at our church and the drywall and the chipped paint. You should really uh, go and read about that temple in 1 Kings 8 when Solomon is dedicated to that temple full processions of the whole country, it seems, long prayers, um, a peace offering that involved 22,000 cattle and 120,000 bulls and goats, and then more sacrifices and another sacrifice of the fat of the peace offering from all those animals, and then completed with 14 days of feasting. And then we had our church potlucks. <laughs> As you can see, this idea of temple can be a little bit confusing. So what is a temple and what does it mean to be the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, that phrase actually comes from 1 Corinthians 6. So first, let's talk about the immediate context, and then we'll kind of grow it out throughout this message. The immediate context of 1 Corinthians 6 is sexual purity. 
But I'm going to argue that the concept of that being the temple of the Holy Spirit demands sexual purity, the concept goes further. But let's read our passage. So 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to read verses 15 to 20. Paul writes, Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spiritually with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. The author and speaker, Francis Chan, was talking about how he tries to interact with people, especially if they've like attacked him on a blog or a social media site. And he said one of the things that helps him react appropriately is to remember that they bear the image of God. And then he used this example that really resonated with me, so I propose it to you. He says, imagine you were alive when the Virgin Mary was pregnant with Jesus. And somehow you knew, you knew that this was the Messiah, this was God inside of her. How would you treat her? How would you talk to her? How would you talk about her? How would you interact with her? What would you do to somebody who was perpetuating the slander and the lies and the rumors and the scandal? If you knew that God was inside her, how would you act? Bring it to today. How should I interact with others? How should you interact with those around you? Well, if they're a human, they bear the image of God. They have God's very image on them. And if they're a believer, they have the Holy Spirit inside of them. So we've already seen that how we interact is important in other messages, but let's take it a little further. In Ephesians 4, 30 to 32, Paul writes, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ forgave you. If I am a believer, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you are the, a believer, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But it goes further. Collectively, believers are also the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. I belong to God because I found my identity in Christ. If you have found your identity in Christ, you belong to God. We have been bought with a price. And that changes things and that matters. 1 Corinthians 10 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do is to be done for the glory of God. Okay, back to our context of this particular passage in 1 Corinthians 6. First, we need to understand that a major philosophy of the day that Paul was dealing with was something called Gnosticism. This is not a philosophy class, but let me give you a couple of handles on how to understand Gnosticism. Anything physical or material is bad. Anything spiritual or invisible is good or can be good. Or another way, anything physical and material is temporary. It doesn't matter. Anything spiritual or invisible, that's eternal. That's the one that matters. A couple of ways this might flesh itself out. One, there's groups of people who would just totally abuse their body with like gluttony, drunkenness, substances, all this, because it doesn't matter. Another one would view it more as anything physical is bad. And so there was entire religious sects that would like practice extreme asceticism, beating themselves to the point of blood or injury to remind their body that they are not, like they don't matter. So Paul is dealing with that. The idea of that he's combating with Gnosticism is how I treat my body or someone else's body matters. Gnosticism would say how I treat my body doesn't matter. How I treat your body doesn't matter because it's just, it's visible. It, it's material. The inside is what matters. Paul's arguing, no, that's not true. I would argue 
that I, I see, and I think you would too, if you look around, you could see residue of this Gnosticism in our culture today, even in our churches today. How do we view the body? How do you view your body? Is it just a mass of molecules, dust to dust idea? Is it just the vessel, the physical earthly vessel that carries around the real you? Is it the prison you're stuck in until you're free in heaven? What is the purpose or intention for the body? Going back to our opening illustration of social media and knives and stuff like that, what is the purpose? Did God have an intended purpose when he designed and created our body? Yes. And that is to glorify God and to worship God. So when you decide what to eat or what not to eat, or what to drink or what not to drink, or how much to sleep, or whether or not to exercise, you are making a glory decision and a worship decision because the body matters. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Back to our context, the Corinthian context, specifically when they were talking about Gnosticism and what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 6 was about sexual freedom, sexual purity. With Gnosticism, it would lead towards a very sexually free life because physical doesn't matter. It's just it's, it's material, it's temporary, so just do what you want. They actually had a saying, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. The idea is they just kind of go together. And the implication, how that saying is translated is basically uh, sex for the body and the body for sex. It's just physical, it's just a natural action and reaction. Nothing matters, it doesn't matter. But what if God made the body? and made it with an intended purpose. Now, what if you are a believer, and so you've been bought with a price, and God now lives inside you, and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And what if God made sex? What if it was his idea? What if he created it, and he has designed the way it's to be used, and also has labeled what is a misuse of that? Now, if I'm a believer, and I claim to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, but I pursue sexuality outside of God's intended design, I am not living true to my identity in Christ. Believers are called to pursue God over sex. Why? Because we are not our own. We belong to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, and our body is his temple. Speaking of temples, Corinth had a lot of them, a lot of different idols. And uh, one of the practices in certain temples was temple prostitution. Now, this is a little bit graphic, but it's biblical and it's historical. So here was the idea. You go to worship this God, you hire a prostitute, you sleep together as an act of worship, and the money from that goes towards that cult. So this was common, and especially if you take that and you tie it together with this Gnosticism where the body doesn't matter, the physical doesn't matter, food for the stomach, stomach for food, sex for the body, body for sex, and you have Christians who claim to be the temple of the Holy Spirit who are visiting cult prostitutes, and they're saying it doesn't matter. I don't believe that. It's just, just food for the body, the body for the food, sex for the body, you know, it's all good. Paul is saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're trying to tell me that you find your identity in Christ and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to the temple of a foreign God and hiring a prostitute as an act of worship to that idol. And you're saying this works? No, it doesn't. That's not your true identity. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 6.20, we read it earlier at the end of our longer passage, but here it is again. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. But this isn't just limited to temple prostitution. It actually involves any distortion of God's design for sex and sexuality. The fact that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit goes into every area of sexuality. My identity as his temple includes all areas of sexuality and more. The temple was a place of worship. I've kind of talked about this already, but I want us to park in. I really want you to think through this. What if we viewed everything we did with our body as an act of worship? Every area and element of our sexuality as an act of worship to God. Does that change anything? Every area of food, how much we eat, what we eat, or for some of you, how little you eat. What about substances or medications? What about exercise? What about sleep? I mean, scientifically, it's just proven sleep is one of the most important things, but so few of us actually prioritize it appropriately. Now, let me remind us, food isn't bad, okay? I'm not 
saying that. Ecclesiastes actually several times points out, eat and drink and be happy. These are good gifts from God. Enjoy them. One commentator on Luke said, when you look at Jesus in the book of Luke, he's pretty much always at a party, coming to a party, or going from a party. So it's not that. These are good gifts. Enjoy them. They're a gift from God. But when they begin to control you, either through drunkenness or gluttony or an addiction or something like that, now it's gone bad because you're not your own. You're the whole, uh, you belong to the Holy Spirit and he should control you. I want to be very clear. My job, my goal today is not to draw lines of what's appropriate and what's not, what's too much, what's too little. No, that is actually a conversation for you and the Holy Spirit. The good news is if you're a believer, he lives inside of you. You're his temple. So you can talk to him. My goal, my job is to help us realize that our body is part of our identity in Christ. And I'm asking you to consider what it means to be a temple, what it means to view everything as an act of worship to him, everything you do with your body. Keep in mind, it's going to look different for me than it's going to look for you, than it's going to look different or, uh, for the person that's watching this with you. So don't draw your lines and then hold everybody else to them. Let me just give you an example. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've been thinking through this, been uh, realizing that I wasn't doing a very good job of taking care of the temple. So I have started a uh, exercise routine and changed how I eat and what I eat. And uh, I wouldn't quite say I'm half the man I was, but it's made a difference because this matters. Here's my point. If I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, how I treat my body is spirituality. It is an act of worship. So pause, process. We have no problem viewing if we read our Bible or when we pray as spirituality. But have we let that translate into if I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, how I treat my body, how I sleep, how I view exercise, how I view food, how I view drink is an act of worship. 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. So I fully understand that what he's saying is physical exercise, being in good shape is good. Spirituality is better. It's more important that we take care of the inside than the outside. But there is still value in that exercise, in taking care of the outside. Let's keep going. So sexuality, our view of food, our body. What about our mind? What about that? Well, you go, why does that have to do with anything? Well, because input equals output. What goes in is going to come out somehow. We talked about this already physically. If you have a, de a diet that's uh, nothing more than McDonald's Big Macs, French fries, and oh, Henry bars, that's going to come out somewhere and not in a good way. But in our mind, what goes in is going to come out somehow. I like to think of it as head, heart, hands, because we do what we believe, we believe what we think. So we do our hands, what we believe, heart. We believe, heart, what we think, head. So what goes into our head gets into our heart, comes out our mind. We, that's why biblical teaching is so important because what we hear, what we think, good preaching, good teaching, affects what we believe, what we believe affects how we act. Let me give you a quick example. I was taking a class on, um, I think, marriage counseling. And the counselor was talking about how he was seeing a woman who uh, was having an affair and he was doing counseling. And he said, what was really weird was she was, you know, disappointed and upset that she got caught or that it had become uh, public, but she really, there was no remorse or anything. So he's trying to figure out why. And this is, you know, this is a Christian woman. So yeah, yeah, it's bad. You know, finally he said, tell me, how do you view your husband? And she goes, oh, well, my husband is sent by God to be the agent of discipline in my life for past sins. He goes, Whoa, wait, what? You believe, you think that God's out to get you. And in order to punish you for past sins, he put this man in your life as your husband. And that's what you believe? Well, no wonder you're not going to find relational or sexual intimacy with him. Because you're thinking the wrong thing that's affecting what you believe and it's affecting how you act. If there's bad actions, you don't just switch the actions. we got to find the bad thinking that led to that change our actions, we change our thinking. Romans 12, 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So 
So we're transformed by changing the way we think. And I, going back to our context today, I think some of us probably need to renew our minds about the intent and purpose of our physical body and health. Why do I bring up this thing about the mind and what goes in and must come out? Because of the head, heart, hands, and this affects everything. I'm talking about the music we listen to, the news we take in, the social media or blog posts that we follow, the preachers we choose to listen to or not, the books we choose to read, TV and shows and movies and entertainment that we partake of, the friends we have, how we do, what we do when we hang out with those friends, uh, how we spend our free time, how we spend our disposable income, what radio stations are preset in our car. And some of you are like, radio stations? Okay, what podcasts are you subscribed to? Uh, what your Bible reading is, if you read your Bible, how you spend your time with God, if you spend time with God, if you've chosen to be a part of a small group or a life group or some kind of group or community who will push you on in your spiritual life. All of that is going in here. It's going to fall here into your heart. It's going to come out in your hands because our thinking affects our beliefs and our belief affects our actions. So remember, you if, if you have come to God through Christ, if you find your identity in him, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. The Holy Spirit now lives inside of you. You have a purpose as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that is to glorify God with your body. You are his temple, which takes us all the way back to our opening illustration. And I ask you, what is God's intended purpose for you specific to this topic? So here's what I want to do. I want to wrap this up with some application questions. I'm going to give you some time to process them. And it is very possible, especially talking about how the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, that there might need to be some confession, which is very appropriate because we're actually going to move from this time into communion. And the Bible encourages us to examine ourselves before we take communion. So I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to give you some time to think about it, to do business with you and God, asking God, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to do about it? So first question especially in response to the I am an ambassador of King Jesus message and our live called missions conference. How will you dedicate and consecrate your body as a temple set apart for God's worship and service? Let's get specific. Maybe pull out your phone and make a note, grab a piece of paper, jot some thoughts if anything comes. How are you using your temple to honor and glorify God in the area of food? How are you using your temple to honor and glorify God in the area of drink? in the area of substances or medications or treatments. In the area of sleep. How are you using your temple to honor and glorify God in the area of exercise? in the area of sex and sexuality. In the area of news and media and entertainment. Keep in mind, like we said, we do what we believe, we believe what we think. So we need to renew our mind. Hopefully this sermon has renewed our mind with these truths of 1 Corinthians 6. And continuing with that idea that we do what we believe, we believe what we think. Let me ask you just a couple of more questions. What is something God is showing you that you need to stop doing? What is something God is showing you that you need to start 
doing. I'm tying this whole message together and making it applicable to you. How will you worship God with your body and your mind, which are his? In Luke 22, we have a record of Jesus at the Last Supper. We read, when the time came, Jesus and his apostles sat down together at the table. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Throughout this message, we've been talking about how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everything we do with our body is an act of worship to God because we have been bought with a price. That price was the very death of Christ where his body, signified by bread, is broken, and his blood, signified by wine, was poured out. What's fascinating is just like we've been talking about in this service, about how everything we do with our body is an act of worship. This, what we remember here, the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, is the ultimate act of worship. As he, in obedience to God his Father, said, not my will, but yours be done. And he laid down his life to buy us so that we could be with him. And he gave us symbols to remember that. And so we do that. So he gave us bread, just like at the Last Supper. He blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. And so let's eat this bread, this physical symbol as a reminder of Jesus' ultimate act of worship. Let's eat together. After dinner, he took the cup of wine and he passed it around and he said, 
This symbolizes the new covenant between God and man. And that covenant is possible because of my blood. So every time you drink this, remember me until that covenant is made complete. When the two parties are brought back together, when we are with God forever because of Jesus Christ, the ultimate act of worship when he poured out his blood for us. So take this cup and drink it in remembrance of him. And so I remind you, every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes back for us.